rise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. I suppose that most of the words that poets and philosophers have written throughout the ages are notations on the human heart or speculations about the mysteries of life and death or another subject, time. For instance, the other night I was browsing through an old book of quotations by famous authors. One quotation I remember went something like this. Know the true value of time. Snatch, seize, and enjoy every moment of it. No idleness or procrastination. Never put off till tomorrow what you can do today. And as I read it, I wondered if Bill Phillips had read that, would he have gotten the point? Would he be doing what he is doing now? It's hard work and I don't seem to be getting any place. The serial number is 4E29815. Make of luck. Standard speed. Into mess messing spring. I have opened a lot of them before, never had any trouble after my business opening, thank folks. Ah, this lock's a tough proposition. Maybe it only seems tough because I'm excited and I'm getting a little shaky. Because I'm working against time. Here I am on the most important job of my life and I can't figure the combination that won't, won't open. Geiger started the whole thing. Never would have happened if it hadn't been for Geiger. Why did they ever take that job in the first place? Uh, dough. Sure, the extra dough. That's why I was in the bank that morning. It's, um, a rather novel job, to say the least, Mr. Phillips. Well, how's that? Well, we'd like to engage you to unlock our safety deposit boxes when keys are lost or misplaced. Well, I don't get it, Mr. Geiger. <laughs> well, you see, Mr. Phillips, bank policy prohibits our retaining a master key. Therefore, the owner of the box is given both keys. Well, they're very often lost. So you need a Jimmy Valentine. <laughs> well, I'm afraid it's not quite that romantic, Mr. Phillips. We simply require a reputable locksmith to open the deposit boxes under bank supervision, you see. And by the way, your company informed us that you're familiar with the Shilby lock. Oh, I'll build it. Oh, then you should be well qualified for the assignment. Of course, we'd expect you to be on call and available every day during banking hours. And? We're prepared to pay... Three hundred dollars per month for this service. Now, how does that strike you, Mr. Phillips? Well, I... I never knew a bank was willing to pay you for cracking their safes. <laughs> well, obviously we are. In a manner of speaking, of course. Well, that sounded like pennies from heaven. Three hundred bucks can buy a lot of cornflakes. I got two calls from the bank the first week. If it was easy to open those tin cans, you could spring the lock with a penknife in less than a minute. Geiger, being the head cashier, always stood by and supervised. He, he almost seemed to admire my work. Then one night, the latter part of the week, Geiger gave me another call. I went over to the bank. It was past six. The shades were drawn. I rapped on the door of his office, and he let me in. Oh. Hello, Phillips. Come in, won't you? Yeah, thanks. That's a little late for opening deposit boxes, isn't it? Uh, yes. That isn't what I called you about. Oh. The Phillips... Uh, Phillips, I, I've been watching you. <laughs> Figured I might be taking some samples home. Oh, no. No, no, no. I believe you're honest. And furthermore, it's virtually impossible for anyone to commit a theft. If the head cashier wished to prevent it. What do you mean, if he wished to prevent it? Phillips, how would you like to make a hundred thousand dollars? Hundred? Well, that's quite a jump from three hundred a month. That's right. Let me show you something. Well, it looks like we're getting a new customer, huh? A very wealthy customer, Phillips. Universal Aircraft plans to bank their payroll money with us. So? There will be over $200,000 in our vault next week. Hmm. They must be paying good wages at Universal. The only person who has the combination to our vault is the manager. But I've got all the keys to the bank. 
Meaning? With your knowledge of locks, it would be a very simple matter. Uh, I, uh, like my boyish tan. I understand you get quite a pallor in things. We could work it, Phillips, the two of us together. I've seen you open locks. You're smart, you're fast. Thanks. I have the information, you have the talent. Phillips, we wouldn't miss. These guys have been known to. When you're playing for high stakes, Phillips, you must take chances. It's too high for me. Half a cent of points, Mike. Now, now, listen. Forget it, Geiger. You're doing business at the wrong window. Now, just a minute, Phillips. I left him sitting there. I waited on the corner for a bus. Got impatient and decided to walk home. I reached the apartment about an hour later, started in the front door, and then I heard a woman's voice behind me. Oh, pardon me. Would you by any chance be Mr. Phillips? Yeah, right. Oh, I've been waiting for you. Well, I guess I shouldn't have wasted all that time walking. I'm Mrs. Geiger, Mr. Phillips. Oh, what can I do for you? Well, I'd like to talk to you. Right away, it's very important. All right. My car's in front. Can we drive? Why not? All right. Let's take the car. We got into her convertible. It was a nice-looking job, but she had better lines in the car. We drove down 8th Avenue, past the park. For some time before she said anything. Mr. Phillips... Forgive me for coming to you like this, but it's about my husband. Mm -hmm. What about it? George has been taking money from the bank. Well, what do you know? It's gone on for more than a year now. Why are you telling me? Well, he, he plans to steal more. He told me he was going to ask you to help him. Yeah. Are you going to do it? No. Oh, I, I'm glad. I don't think you are. Well, what do you mean? Well, it doesn't add up, that's all. Guy is your husband. If I go into the deal with him, he gets clean with the bank. He'll never be suspected. Well, that is, it's a hundred or one against him being suspected. Yes, but... Well, so, he'll be pretty safe. At least until he gets another bright idea. What's the matter, Mrs. Geiger? Uh, don't you like your husband? How oh, dare Relax, you? Relax, Mrs. Geiger. I don't know what, what all this is about, but there's one thing I do know. I don't want any part of it. Now, you can stop this trolley. I transfer here. Got out of the car and walked away. Somehow I could smell fish frying, and it wasn't Friday. And she was up to something, I was sure of that. I, I tried to figure out what, well, what she wanted from me. Couldn't get a total. All I had to do was open that safe for Geiger, and both their worries were over. So where did she take all the trouble to warn me off? Maybe she was tired of her husband. Well, then why didn't she just turn him in and let it go at that? Yeah, why didn't she... All of a sudden, I got a notion. Yeah. Made a lot of sense. Around 10 next morning, I was sure Geiger was at the bank. I called her at home. Would she join me for lunch at the Barbizon? She'd be delighted. I was waiting at a corner table when she walked in. I hope I'm not late. Uh, no, no, no. I, I just got here myself. Sit down. Thank you. You were asking me some questions last night, Mrs. Geiger. Now, I'd uh, like to ask you one. Why, of course. Mrs. Geiger, uh, when did you... When did you, uh first decide you wanted to kill your husband. What? Surprised. <laughs> well, I gave the matter a lot of thought last night. That's how come I'm so smart this afternoon. You must be out of your mind. Oh, sure, sure. You don't really believe that I plan to kill my husband. Not you. Me. What's the most preposterous statement you've made yet? Why would you want to do a thing like that? I wouldn't. Unless you could get me to fall for you. What could be more ideal? Geiger's sitting on top of 200 G's locked in a vault. Only you don't love Geiger anymore. You just love what's in that vault. Listen, Mr. Phillips. So you find a nice, personable young man with a knowledge of locks who can help Geiger open the vault. Are you quite finished? No, not quite. You see, you suggest to this young man that after he removes the money from the vault, it might not be a bad idea to close the door on Geiger. He'll be found dead. The police will... 
check the shortage, blame Geiger, and boy and girl make off with 200000 very clever. Isn't it, though? Then, according to your plan, all I have to do now is to get you to fall in love with me. That'd be kind of hard to do. Oh, it is? Why? Well, I don't even know your first name. <laughs> it's Kitty. Oh? Hello, Kitty. Somehow, after our first luncheon date, I saw quite a bit of Kitty Geiger. She wasn't hard to take, not at all. Then one afternoon, a couple of weeks later, Kitty suggested we take a drive down to the beach. I drove, and she sat quietly beside me. I watched the wind playing tag with her hair. Smelled her perfume. We drove most of the afternoon. It was turning dark when we started back to town. Why are we stopping? I thought we might go down on the beach. Yeah, it's getting late. You do, huh? Mm-hmm. Kitty. Yes? How did you happen to marry Gaia? Oh, I don't know. I... I thought I loved him. Did you? No. No, I didn't. But you wanted to. And you figured he could give them to you. Maybe. Kitty, uh... Kitty, how do, how do you feel about me? Well, I... I like you. I like you very much. Anything more? Maybe. Is, uh... Is that the truth? Okay, before you go home, you can drop me at the apartment. I'm going to call Geiger. Bill! I'm going to do it for you, Kitty. But if you ever double-cross me, I'll kill you. I think, my friends, that I feel another quotation coming out. But that's what you get for writing so many different things about me. But it tickles my vanity. Well, quote, Time that strengthens friendship weakens love. Unquote. The author of that was a Frenchman. I'm afraid he was a rather cynical gentleman when it came to man and maid, but applied to the case of Bill Phillips and Kitty Geiger, it might be appropriate. Is everything set? Yeah, tomorrow night. What time? 8.30. Do you think he suspects anything? Not a chance. He's too concerned about getting his hands on that dough. How do we work it? He'll hand the money to me from the vault. I'll pack it in a suitcase just outside the door. Then as soon as he gets to the last pack of bills... You shut the vault. Right. You'll be in the car on 54th Street. I'll meet you at the alleyway. Bill? Bill, uh, after you do it, how long will he live? An hour. Two at the most. And when the police find him in the morning? The CPA will take an inventory, uncover the shortage, and then put two and two together. Which adds up to what? He was in a deal, somehow got stuck in the vault, and his accomplice skipped with the dough. But where the accomplices? Well, that's been all taken care of, baby. I got the name and address of a guy who's just finished a ten-year stretch for grand larceny. He's out on parole. We're not taking anyone else in No, no, of course not. I'm just going to see to it that 300 bucks in new bills get planted in this guy's room. He just seems to be picked up. Uh, Sounds good. So it's perfect. Now, listen to me. Here's what we do. Tomorrow night, I go into the bank with Geiger. He's got a key to the front door. We'll get started about 11. By 11.30, we should be finished if everything goes the way we plan. How's it coming? Be quiet. I'll have it in a second. It worked. There's your 200 Gs, Mr. Geiger. The money was stacked in neat little packages on the floor of the vault. Geiger took one look and his eyes lit up like a drive-in stand. I sent him in to get it. Three or four minutes, we had the suitcase almost filled. I looked into the vault. How many more? That's about it. Just these bills here and we'll be ready to... Phillips? Phillips, what are you doing? Phillips, aren't we going to take the rest of the money? No. So long, Geiger. I went to the side door, unlocked it with Geiger's key, started to step out into the street and tripped over something. And then it happened. Somehow I'd set off a burglar alarm. There wasn't much time to lose. I told Kitty to drive over to a rooming house on 2nd Avenue. 
The guy who was to plant the dough for me was waiting on the corner. I gave him two envelopes. One was for 300 new bills. The other contained 300 unmarked bills. This second envelope was for the gentleman's trouble. Even frame-ups are expensive these days. Then Kitty and I circled back over to Broadway and 45th Street. I took the suitcase into a bus depot and checked it in a pay locker. I gave Kitty the key. We were both a little jumpy by then, so I suggested we go someplace for a drink. We had two, three, four, who knows. Uh, uh, how do you feel, baby? Oh, I feel wonderful. Wait a minute, Kitty. What? What's wrong? I'll leave this for the bill. Come on. Extra paper. Get your new extra paper. Boy. about the big... Boy, let me have one of those, huh? Here. Thanks. Read all about the bank robbery. Extra paper. What is it? That burglar alarm. They got to the safe in time. Tiger's alive. Geiger was alive. He'd been arrested, but they... That didn't help. As soon as things got tough, he'd sing songs about Kitty and me all over headquarters, maybe before. I told Kitty there was only one thing to do. We'd have to get out of town and quick. We made arrangements for me to get plane tickets to Mexico first thing in the morning. I got to the airport around seven, picked up the tickets, and then took a cab to Kitty's house. I thought it might be a good idea if I weren't seen going in, so I went around to the back gate. Walked up the steps to the porch. I was just about to ring the doorbell when I heard voices coming from the living room. I slipped around to the window, pressed myself against the wall, and took a quick look inside. Kitty was talking with a man who carried a revolver. The man was George Geiger. I don't believe that it's your girl, George. How else would I be here? But when they found you in the vault... I had to think of some sort of alibi. I said I was passing by the bank, found the door open, went in to investigate. Someone struck me from behind, I woke up in the boat. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I agree with you, Kitty. But apparently the police thought differently when they arrested an ex-thief with $300 of the stolen money in his possession. Tell me, Kitty, who's this... this silent partner of ours? It, it was a frame-up. Bill did it. It appears that Bill did quite a number of things. Among them, shutting the vault on me. George, I didn't know he would. I, I didn't know anything about it, believe Kitty, me. Kitty, I haven't the faintest desire to believe or disbelieve you. I'm only interested in one thing. Where's the money? Bill has it. Where? George, I'll make a bargain with you. I'll tell you where it is if, if you'll forget what's happened. George, we can start again with that money. We can be happy again. We could be, Kitty. I, I can make up the shortage at the bank. We'll be even with the world. Tell me where it is, Kitty. It's in Bill's apartment. I'll get it. Wait for me. I won't be long. I'll wait, George. Uh, hello? Hello, Western Airlines. When's the first plane to South America? You... Brazil? Can I pick up the ticket at the airport? Right, I'll, I'll be there right away. Thank you. Hello, Kitty. Bill. I, uh, I got the tickets. Well, 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 that's fine. When do we leave? Oh, not until this evening. Oh, well, that'll give me a chance to pack. Mm -hmm. Do you want to stop back for me later this afternoon? Sure, why not? Hey, you look worried, Kitty. Anything bothering you? No, no not a thing. Oh. Well, I'll pick you up later then, huh? I'll be with you. Went out the front door. I wasn't worried whether anyone saw me or not. I stood under an elm tree on the neighbor's lawn. <laughs> Didn't have to wait long. Kitty came out in a few minutes. She was carrying an overnight bag. You going someplace, Kitty? Bill. Well, you're early, baby. We're not supposed to leave until tonight. Oh, well, you see, Bill, I... Well, there are some things I have to do. Sure, sure, sure. I understand. But first, you and I are uh, going to do a little sight. Bill? Bill, we've been driving for hours. Where are we going? Oh, we're just taking a look at the ocean. I thought you liked the ocean, Kitty. Remember the first time we took this trip? Bill, let's go back, please. Remember where we stopped? Yeah, I think it was right about here. I lit a cigarette. Hey, you have a match, Kitty? It's a lighter. Thanks. 
Well, then I agreed to steal the money and lock Geiger in the vault. That must be a terrible way to die. Billy. I remember what I said, Kitty. If you ever double-crossed me, I'd kill you. Take me out, Bill. Take me out, please. Too chilly for you. All right, we'll go back. We drove slowly back into town. Kitty didn't say a word. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I drove up 54th, swung the car into an alleyway. Bill, this is the bank. That's right, Kitty. Let's get out. No. Come on. But Ed, it's closed. Of course. You never break into a bank in broad daylight. We're not going in. Sure we are. Just as soon as I pick this back door lock... Ah, these, these door locks are easy. This should only take a few seconds. Bill, what are you going to do? We're going to get you some money, Kitty. More money than you ever saw in your life. But there isn't any there anymore. You know that. Ah. Oh, there's still a little left. There must be. What are those stocks and bonds with all those pretty colors? They're negotiable. You'll enjoy looking them over, Kitty. Come on. Bill. Bill will be caught. No, no. They'd never suspect lightning to strike twice. Anyway, we're too smart for them, Kitty. You take me, for instance. I'm a real clever guy. That's why you went for me, isn't that right? Now, I want you to watch this, baby. I'll show you just how clever I am. Bill, no, 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 please. There's one tumbler. <laughs> Easy now. There's the releasing spring. Bill. Hey, take a look, Kitty. Take a good look. That's the stuff people lie and cheat and steal for, even kill for. And it's all yours. I'm giving it to you, every dollar. Well, don't stand back there, Kitty. Come closer. You can see it better. Come on, come on, come closer. It makes you, makes you feel just like a kid in a candy shop, doesn't it? Look at it, Kitty. Look at it for the rest of your life. You look at it for the rest of your life. Hey, Kitty! got that wild idea, I wouldn't be trying to open this vault now. I, I forgot to give Kitty a lighter back. Yeah. It has a name on it. And I've been using it to work with. The fluid's almost gone now, and this, this job's beginning to look hopeless. I need more time. I know I'll write a note. I'll write a note telling the whole story and wrap it around the lighter. The police shouldn't have any trouble piecing the case together. <laughs> ah, the lighter's gone out. Ah, I'm going to have to give up. Ah, it seems funny. With all my knowledge of Fox, I can't open a simple affair like this. Ah, of course... I've never tried to open a vault from the inside before. Yes, Bill Phillips learned the value of time. Learned it in those last few failing minutes. Learned it in darkness and with despair. Not a very happy story, to be sure. But then in my position, you run into all kinds. Happy ones and sad ones, just like the quotations I told you about. Terrible ones and fateful ones. I see many who use their hours wisely, and others I see, too, who waste time. And often, much too often, I dare say, time wastes them. The Clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. Written by Lawrence Clee and starring Hart McGuire. You heard Ken Wayne as Bill Phillips. Others in the cast were Dinah Shearing and Ken Hannum. The Clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset. 
promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Time is uniform. There are just so many seconds and hours and minutes in each day. Their length never changes, and yet they often seem to change. When you're traveling, for instance, time may lengthen or quicken according to your mood. I'm not referring to the conveyance in which you travel. It doesn't matter if you use a train, a bus, or a boat. But when you travel by car, alone, when you sit behind the wheel and watch the highway ribbon out in front of you as for mile after endless mile, time hangs heavy on your hands, and you long for a way to ease the monotony. Yeah, fill her up. Okay. Yeah. All right. Guess I'll stretch the pen a little. Gets kind of trapped behind that wheel after a while. Uh, how <laughs> yeah. far is it to Salt Lake City? Oh, about uh, 200 miles, maybe 250. Oh, well, I ought to make it by 3 in the morning if my luck holds up. Well, the road's pretty good from here on in. Uh, say, do you know anything about radio? What, uh, car radios? Yeah. Ah, we install them here. Well, uh, take a look at mine, will you? Something's wrong with it. Sure thing. Oh, when you're on the road alone, a radio's a good bet. It helps to pass the time. Yeah, I know how it is. Now, it gets kind of lonesome when you travel the way I do. I put in 16, 1,700 miles a week, maybe. <laughs> it's a lot, mister. Uh, you got a bad wire connection on that set. Can you fix it? Yeah, it takes me about three minutes. Well. Uh, yes, uh, say, look, mister, you uh, got room for another passenger in the car? Another passenger? Ah, uh, yeah. I wouldn't ask, except I'm so sorry for the kid, you know. And she, she said something about being, you said something about being lonesome, rather. Mm. And she's trying to hitchhike her way to Salt Lake City to see her old lady. Uh, some guy dropped her off at the fork about an hour ago, and she's been, uh, what, she's been waiting for a lift ever since. Well, I guess I can give her a ride. Uh, where is she? Inside. <laughs> Good looker, too. Nice shape. <laughs> hey, don't take it easy. I'm a married man with two kids. Ah, well, you know how it is. <laughs> sure, I know how it is. I'll ask her if she wants to lift while you fix that wire. Okay, mister. Okay. Oh, excuse me. What do you want? Oh, the gas attendant outside said you were looking for a lift to Salt Lake City. Uh, you going that far? I'm going to try to make it tonight, yeah. Well, uh, I don't usually like to... Uh, my name's Keeler, Leonard Keeler. Everybody calls me Len. My name's Lola Pickens. Well, if you get your stuff... I don't have any suitcase. Oh, it's having light, huh? Hey. Uh, well, uh, are you coming? I, uh, I guess so. You don't have to worry. I'm not the kind who makes passes. I, uh, wasn't thinking... Okay, that. mister. Radio's working fine now. I'll be right there. Now, come on, Lola. There's a long stretch of road ahead of us. We'd better get started. Cigarette? Yes, thanks. Oh, there's a lighter on the dashboard. <laughs> there's so many gadgets up here. Uh, the round one. Oh. Uh, the flat one for the heater. Which works the defroster. And the dial turns on the radio. Where's the gadget that turns on the dishwasher? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and if you don't think I'd have a dishwasher in here if I needed one, well, <laughs> I like a lot of cheesecake on my car. <laughs> I'm willing to pay for them, so why not have them? It's a nice car. Yes, yeah, sure is. Where are you from, Lola? Chicago. And you're hitchhiking all the way to Salt Lake City? It's the cutest way to travel. I'll say. Oh, you're, you're pretty nervy, a girl like you traveling on the road alone. You ever run into trouble? Oh, once or twice. Every once in a while you come across a Romeo who thinks he's terrific. But I know how to handle that kind. I bet you do. What do you do for a living, Lola? No, oh, I wasn't getting nosy or anything like that. I was just, you know, just trying to pass it. Oh, it's all right. I don't mind telling you. I've been almost everything from a waitress to a dancer in a burlesque line. You got experience, huh? Too much. Now I'm going home to my folks. That's where I should have stayed in the first place. Yeah, there's no place like home. Well, what do you do, Mr. Keeler? Call me Len, huh? Oh, I'm a salesman. Oh? What's your line? 
You won't laugh now. No, of course I won't laugh. Of course not. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know why, but that always gets a laugh. Now, what's so funny about courses? Oh, I don't know. You wait till you're fat and 40. You'll find out that I'm practically your best friend. <laughs> Oh, I say, it's good to have company when you hit the road. <laughs> it's nice to meet someone who's regular. <laughs> What's that? Mm, what? It's like a man standing up there at the bend in the road. Uh-oh, waiting for a lift, I guess. Poor guy. It's getting dark. Mm. I know how it is when you stand out there and watch the cars go past you. Well, Lola, and as much as you've got a heart as big as a pumpkin, suppose we give the guy a break, huh? Hey, looks okay. Might even be an XGI. How far are you going, mister? Wheeler. Where's that? Uh, about 150 miles from here. On the road to Salt Lake. You're in luck, brother. Ah, here we go again. Mind if I have another cigarette, man? Help yourself, Laura. You comfortable back there? Yeah. Thanks. Been on the road long? No. It's getting kind of late. I guess I better put on the light. Why, you want a cigarette back there? No. Well, as long as we're all traveling together, I may as well introduce myself. My name's Keela. This is Miss Lola Pickens. Rhymes with chicken. Horace Green. <laughs> I said her name was. I heard you. Not very soon, is it? No. What's your name, friend? Leach. Mind if I ask you what your job is? I, uh, haven't been working at it lately. Well, what is your line when you work at it? I'm, uh, in ladies' wear. You don't say. Who'd you work for? You never heard of the firm. I bet I did. I heard of every ladies' wear firm in the country. I, uh, I work for Lewis Brothers. Lewis Brothers? Mm-hmm. Uh, where's that? Salt Lake. Oh, you got me there, brother. That is one firm I have never heard of. They're out of business now. Oh, I'm looking for, for another setup, huh? I'm not looking for anything, mister. Including conversation. Well, I just thought Oh, no, leave him alone, man. Maybe he just doesn't want to talk. That's all right with me. Let me see the rest of the moment. Oh, sure. Well, it's like we're climbing. We're going into the mountains, I guess. Oh, wait a minute. It's a crossroad. Hmm. Route 7, Salt Lake City. Route 7A, Salt Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> so you get there either way. Well, I take a peek at the map and see which is the shorter here. Take Route 7, mister. Uh, no, it seems like 7A is shorter. Listen to me. Take 7. Now, wait a minute, friend. I'm still driving this car. We'll take 7A. It's so short, eh? Sure. Save maybe 20 miles. Go through the hills. This car can climb like nobody's this. <sighs> Hope the good weather keeps up. The radio said it might get foggy before morning. Hey, that reminds me. May as well have some music. Don't put the radio on, mister. Why not? I... I don't like music. Now, look here, friend. Seems as though you don't like anything in this car at all. Maybe you want me to drop you off at the next turn. No. Uh, no, don't do that. <laughs> uh, look, uh, don't mind me, Mr. I... Uh, I haven't been feeling so well lately. I'm I'm sort of convalescing. Oh, that's different. But, but if you don't mind my saying so, a good disposition never stopped anybody from getting better. Sure. Sure, you're right. What was the matter with you? Uh, it was my ear. Your ear? Oh. Mastoid? Not exactly, no. I, but but I, I'm all right now. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Lola? Yes, then? Snap that radio on, huh? Hmm. It's, it's got to warm up first. Good set, though. How's that? Ah, couldn't be better. Oh, gee, it makes me feel like that. <laughs> me too. Hey, say, mister, I, uh, I wonder if I could ask you for a favor. Sure. Well, uh, my father's very sick in Wheeler, and I'm, uh, I'm getting kind of worried about it. You want to make a call or something? Uh, if you don't mind. Oh, it's all right with me. Except, where can you make it? I don't think we'll hit another town until we get out of these hills. Well, there's a farmhouse up ahead. I I could make a call from there and pay him for it. Okay, Leach. Will you wait for me? Naturally. 
You don't think I'd leave you flat out here at this time of night. Thanks. Try to make it fair. No hurry. He's a funny kind of guy. Yeah, let's see. All the time he was sitting in the back seat, I got a creepy feeling. Creepy? Like, like he was staring at the back of my neck or something. He's a nice neck. I don't blame him. We interrupt this program for a special announcement. Well, what's this? Hmm? We've just been notified of a four-state alarm broadcast for an inmate of the Lowell Hospital for the Insane located near Pike City. That's only about 20 miles, don't it? This man escaped from the asylum two hours ago, and he's a very dangerous homicidal maniac. His name is John Slade, although he is probably using an alias. He is five feet 11 inches tall, light brown hair, blue eyes, about 170 pounds. <laughs> This man is dangerous to both men and women, and he strikes without warning. He may possibly be immediately identified by the fact that he has an insatiable desire to cut small sections from the hair of his victim. <laughs> if you see this man, please notify the nearest state police barracks. Now we turn you to our regular program. Now wait a minute. Simply because that general description fits Leach. But how do we know? Huh? What's the matter, Lola? I... I can feel... Look at my hair. It's the back lens. Oh. There's a piece of your hair missing. Yes, time passes quickly on the road when there's someone to chat with and a pleasant tune to listen to on the radio. But when that tune goes sour and the conversation turns to death, time stands still. Oh, no. Stop the car, Lynn. Let's get out of here. I can't see the storm. Well, what's the matter? He's coming back. Thanks for waiting, Mr. Keeler. <laughs> Did you, uh, reach your father? Uh, no, the, uh, the line was busy. Well, then uh, try again at the next farmhouse. Uh, never mind, I can wait. Lynn? Yeah? You're all out of cigarettes. I... Uh, yeah, yeah, here, I got you. No. What? I... I mean, I don't want to smoke right away now. Anyway... How about you, Miss Bill? Uh, no, 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 thanks. No. Hey! <laughs> What's the matter, Miss Dixon? I... I thought you touched me. Is that any reason to jump like that? I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean anything by it. I was just going to ask, would you you folks mind if I sat up front? No. Okay. I mean, you can't sit here. I can't? There's not enough room, Leach. Oh. Uh, Don't you need some gas, Lynn? Gas? Yeah, oh, sure, yeah, gas. Yeah, I'd better gas up at the next station uh, if we can find one. I'll, I'll keep my eyes open. Say, hey, maybe it would be cozy if Leach sat up here with us. No. We could stop the car for a minute and he could get out and come into the front. Out? Oh, oh, sure. Uh, is there room? <laughs> Lola can move over. She doesn't take up much space. Yes. Stop the car, Len. He can sit in front. Okay, Leach. Hop out and come in front. That's on his land. He's running after us. Don't stop, Len. Don't stop. We wouldn't get far in a flat. Jimmy, what's the idea? Well, it's a funny thing. It must have been in gear. She jumped ahead without warning. Yeah. Hey, you got a flat. I know. Left front tire. I uh, guess we'd better go to work on it. Hey, let me do it. Huh? Now, let me fix it. I, uh... I want to pay you back for the ride. The spare's in the trunk. Here's the key. Yeah. Okay. Won't take me long. Lynn, what are we going to do? Now, take it easy, Laura. There's a way out of this. We can outsmart him. There must be a way. As soon as he gets the tire fixed, can you start the car again and leave him behind? The ignition key's on the same ring with the trunk key. He's got them both. I'll go crazy if we don't get rid of him. 
Every time he moves, I can almost feel his fingers around my throat. How do you think I feel? My, my scalp's been crawling up and down my spine. What do we do? We've got to play it straight, you understand? Whatever we do, we can't let on we know. But suppose he gets it. He won't if we play it smart, Lola. Here. Hmm? Here he comes. Well, yeah, this shouldn't take more than ten minutes, Mr. Keeler. Uh, you, you sure you, you don't want some help? Hell no, you stay where you are. That suit of yours is too good to roll on this road. Len, for heaven's sake, think of something. I do. One thing we've got to do, stall for time. Lord, do you think you can play up to him a little so he won't try anything until I work out a plan? Play up to him? You know, be sweet. Make believe you think he's handsome or clever or something like that. You don't ask me to play up to a maniac, I couldn't. But our lives may depend on this, Laura. And we run. And we wonder. Sure, we'll be right where he wants it. Man, I'm scared. I'm so scared. I'm sick. Bite where you can onto yourself. He's looking at us. Huh? Come on now. Say something on board. I... I wonder what time we'll get into Salt Lake City. You do it. Keep him from being suspicious. Why keep him alive? If there's no other way, what else can I do? To Len and Lola, changing that tire seemed to be an age. But to Leach, it was just one of those things. Okay, Mr. Keeler, she's fixed. Thanks a lot. Don't mention it. We'll, uh, we'll stop off at the first gas station to have that other tire. Hey, didn't you say you needed some gas? Yeah. The gauge on your dashboard says you pull up. Uh, that gauge doesn't work too well. You can't trust it. Well, give me the keys, Leach. Uh, I think I'll drive, Mr. Keeler. What? Hmm? Uh, for safety's sake. You know, you've been behind the wheel for quite a while, I imagine. It's uh, better if we change over. But, uh, you see, I, I'm not tired. I uh, move up, Mr. Keeler. Let me take over. All right, if you insist. I can sit in the back. No, stay here with me in the front. Sure, there's plenty of room. Look over, Lola. <laughs> All set? Yeah. Here we go. Tell you the truth, I'd, uh, I'd like to see Lola again. Would you, Mr. Leach? You, uh, you remind me of someone I used to know. Who is she? Her name was Charlotte. Charlotte? That's nice. Like in Ruth, huh? <laughs> you, you said her name was Charlotte. That's right. She's dead. Oh. Well, maybe you're getting tired, Leach. Not a bit. I just started to drive. But, you, well, you're not used to the car. I mean... I'll let you know when I'm tired. Yes. Aren't you going rather fast? Fifty-five, that's all. That's all right. This car can take it. We, uh... We ought to be hitting a town pretty soon now. Why are you slowing down? I'm, uh, taking this turn. But... How do you know it's the right one? I know. All right, Lola. I'll be a backseat driver now. Do you know this road, Mr. Lee? I've been over it before. The woods are kind of thick here. Yeah. Why don't we pass the village? I can't understand Lola, why... Don't, we... don't, don't be afraid. I mean... Well... We're strangers. But we're both... Nice guys. Aren't we, Lee? We don't have much farther to go. We don't? What do you mean? We're not even near Salt Lake yet. I, uh... I mean we don't have much longer to ride in this jalopy until we get out of these woods. Oh. You know, I... I think that the first time we come to, I'm getting a hotel room. I mean, I'm tired, and I guess I'll call it a night. Well, anything you say, Miss Pickens. You won't forget to stop, will you? I won't forget. What time you got, Mr. Keeler? Hmm? 8.20. Oh, that's fine. Is it? What's the matter now? Why are you slowing down again? Yeah, there's a sign of that road fork. I want to read it. Can't you read it from here? No. Looking up and down the road. Lenny wants to make sure there are no other cars. All right. We can't 
can't wait any longer. Reach into that side pocket fast. Have you got a gun? No, no, but I, I just remember there's a pocket knife in there. Quick. Where? Okay, folks, get out. What? This is the end of the line. I've got the car keys, so you may as well get out. Go on, Lola. Two as he says. Yeah. That's right. Is this a, is this a hold up? A hold up? No. Then what's the big idea, Mr. Leach? You'll find out, Mr. Keeler, in just a second. Maybe we won't wait that long. <laughs> I can't look at him. Well, it's a good thing I had this knife. I, I guess you had to kill him, didn't you? Well, there's no other way. I hope maybe you could do it differently. I mean, he couldn't help himself. He was sick. Well, he's, he's better off this way, Laura. Well, let's leave him here and get back into the car. We can drive to, to the nearest police station and... Len? What are you doing? Uh, I was just looking at his hair. His hair? It's so long, soft. Like yours is. <laughs> I think I'll just cut off a piece of it. Keep it. <laughs> What's the matter, Lola? Don't you like what I'm doing? I don't believe you. You couldn't be. It wasn't. No, Lola. It wasn't. Keep away from me. Come here, Lola. Keep away. I won't use the knife on you, Lola. Just my hands. Just my hands and my fingers on your throat. Hey, how was that? Please. called us about 20 minutes ago, and we told him to stall right here. He recognized Slade when Slade picked him up. The car was stolen. Right up, Slade. Keep moving. Have you got him, Pete? Come on. Yeah, yeah, we got him. Are you sure that all right. you're all right, Miss? Let's move. I've never felt better in my life. Yes, the road gets lonesome when you're spinning along behind the wheel. And it's lonesomer still when you're beside it, waiting for a lift. Only sometimes, it's safer to stay at home. As the walrus said to the carpenter on that memorable occasion at the beach, the time has come and I must be on my way. I have an appointment with an old friend of mine, a watchmaker by profession. He's quite a pleasant fellow and I enjoy his company. He's restful, so to speak, at least for me. Somehow, whenever I leave him, I always feel well-adjusted. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. Written by Lawrence Clee and starring Hart McGuire. You heard Wendy Playfair and Charles Tingwell as Lola and Len, as Leach, Owen Weingott, as garage attendant, Ozzie Wendon. The clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. <laughs> Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock.
It's nice to have friends, and I can count quite a few of my own. Most people consider me to be a very good fellow to know. Well, if you'll pardon a bit of boasting on my part, they find that their time is enjoyable, and the minutes and hours of their lives are valuable things indeed. To these people, working towards an end for themselves and their families, time provides them with the opportunity to relax, to do a job and to build for the future. Yes, I count myself lucky to have so many friends. But I also have some enemies. Who are my enemies? I'll tell you who they are. They're the inmates of prisons throughout the world. They're the misfits and the socially outcast. Many of them can be reclaimed. Many of them serve out their terms, pay their debt to society, and later begin anew. But there are a few, a very few, who will never change. These are the hardened types, the killers to whom human life is cheap. These are the ones who watch my hands as they slowly turn year after year, who watch my face knowing that for them time has no rewards. These are the ones, my friends, who hate me and who despise the world. Wait. You got the rods. Here's yours. Stick it under your shirt, quick. Mm -hmm. Duke slipped them to me about an hour ago. We've gone into the yard. The Duke's all right. He comes along. He gave me the dope in the hash house. We go east to the river, then we cut across to the bay. We hide out on the beach, and Joe will pick us up there on the fast boat. I got it. When do we make the break? Now. Now? Yeah. All I was waiting for was to get my fingers on a rod. But I figured that we were done. I'm the show, Smiley, just like I always run it. Oh, sure, sure, Red. We know. We Everything's know. worked yeah. out. We can't lose. And we can't wait. We start the panic as they start taking us back inside. I'll short-circuit the lights by firing into the switch box. We pick up the guard and march. Right. Look, Smiley, this is it. I don't want to be grabbed, see? We either get out of here on our feet or we get carried out in a box. Understand? Yeah, and I'll do anybody who stands in our way. Okay. Set the duke off. Here comes the guard. All right, man. Time's up. I have to file back to your cell. <laughs> Forward, march. Fire! The gun's on fire! 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 Stand where you are. Fire! Nobody move. Stand where you are or I'll shoot. You want to live, screw? Why not? Start getting us out of here. You know the way in the dark. Start moving fast. I blow your head off. Smiley. I'm here, Red. Duke, right behind you, old man. You did a nice job, Screw. <laughs> you let me go now, won't you? You're free. There's the car, Red. Don't lift it like he said. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where are you going, Screw? Hmm? I... Why, I, I, I thought you were taking me with you. We ain't got no room. We can't take you, and we can't leave you behind. Come, huh? No. No! No! <laughs> Now, let's get out of here fast. What time you got, Smiley? Ten five. Yeah, he's late. I tell you, ain't coming, Red. Look at that fog out there under water. He couldn't find his beach if he tried. Do we come this far, then lose out? Don't irritate yourself, my boy. Joe's a man to be trusted. He'll be here. Yeah. When? When the fog lifts. Tomorrow night, perhaps. Remember what he told us. We're to keep the same rendezvous every night at this time until he shows up with the boat. And while we're waiting, what do we do? Stand here on the beach until we're spotted? I must admit we didn't allow for that contingency. Hey, Wade. Look. At what? On the other side of the beach. In that cove. That's a house. The only one I can see. There you are. We can help ourselves to shelter, so to speak. How do we know who's in there? Ah, what difference does it make? We take over, that's all. Yeah, take over. Okay, come on. Let's go. These are the facts as we have learned them up to now. 
one of the most daring jailbreaks of all time. The prisoners escaped through sheer nerve, brutally killing a guard as they left. It is uncertain as to what direction they took, but all state police have been alerted. Hello, Anne. Finish work, Dad? Oh, yes. I was just getting some more news about the amazing jailbreak that happened this afternoon. Now, what did I do with my glasses? On the table, Dad. Oh, yes. It was simply fantastic. They forced a guard to lead them right out of the prison. And then they killed him. Oh, who did? Darling, don't you ever listen to anything I say? I'm sorry, my dear. What were you saying about a prison? Never mind. I can never get you to listen unless I talk about bugs and test tubes. Well, I had quite a day today in the lab. Really? I've developed a new medium for my cultures. It ought to prove extremely satisfactory. You know, darling, I'm glad we bought this old house here on the beach. Are you? Oh, it's so pleasant for you. And you're so happy here. Yes, I'm very happy, Anne. It's nice to have a laboratory right inside the house and to be free of all outside disturbances. But what about you? Are you happy here? Of course I am. You know, perhaps it was selfish of me to bring you all the way out here to this deserted spot. You're young and you want excitement and company. Oh, I get plenty of company when I go into town twice a week. Unless for excitement. I'd much rather help you win the next Nobel Prize. <laughs> Nobel Prizes aren't just given away. I've got a lot of work ahead of me. One day, Dad, you're going to be a famous man. <laughs> am I? One day, when people mention the name of Dr. William Carter, they'll... Oh, now, who on earth can that be? I don't know. Who well, might be someone looking for directions? I'll see who it is. Yes? Inside. <gasps> Dad! Inside, I said! Dad! Well, what's going on here? Smiley, take a look through that door. Okay. Is this a hold-up? Not exactly, young lady. If you'd like an explanation... Shut up, Duke. Who else is in this dump outside of you two? No one. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Ah, uh, the joint's empty, Red. That's good. Take care of the phone. Dad, he, he's tearing the phone from the wall. Well, that's the smartest thing to do under the circumstances. Wait! I know who they are. They're the three escaped convicts. I remember their description on the radio. Pipe They're... down, baby. Everything's all right, honey. Now, just keep your head. Permit me to introduce myself and my colleagues. My name is Bowen, Charles Bowen, but I'm more widely known as the Duke. This gentleman on my left is Red Fulton. You may have heard of him. He's been serving a life term for murder. You talk too much, Duke. Smiley, the gentleman on his right, is another genius at homicide. How many do you have to your credit, Smiley? <laughs> Four. Red's got me, baby. He got eight. Can he, Gav? Are you? Me? You got anything to eat in this dump? There, there's a little cold meat in the icebox. Get it out. What? I said get it out. Hey, what goes with you? Can't you hear? Go on, Anne. Prepare some sandwiches for our guests. So, go with her. The pleasure is all mine after you, lady. What's your name, mister? Carter. Dr. Carter. Doctor of medicine. Retired. The dame your daughter? Yes. All right. Sit down. Oh, thank you. Look, Doc. Let me get something straight in your head before we go any further. My pals and I want it, and want it bad. This is only a stopover, as far as we know. And we'll be getting out of here tomorrow night. I see. Now, just so you remember, we've got a rap over our skulls. That means the chair if we're caught. So we ain't going to be bashful about adding a couple more to the list we already have. Do you mean you'll kill us in cold blood if it becomes necessary? you catch on fast, Doc. If you take it easy, don't try any gags. Maybe we'll walk out of here like we came in. Quiet. If not, you and your daughter better figure to get yourselves measured for a couple of kimonos. Yeah, wooden ones. I think I understand. Make sure you do, Doc. How many rooms you got in this shack? Five. Well, I only counted four, Red. Where's the last one, Doc? Downstairs, in, in the cellar. I use it as a laboratory. Let's go down and look. I, I assure you there's nothing down there, but we'll look anyway. Go on, move. Hey, it's an opening in the floor. This trap door leads to the cellar. There are stairs going down. Smiley, you first. The dock next. I'm last. 
I assure you, there's nothing down here that would interest you. Then you've got nothing to worry about by showing it to us. Uh, please be careful. I have several valuable specimens in the test tubes that are important to me. What are you reaching for? The light switch, of course. Hey, wait. <laughs> Get a load of this place. Yeah. What's all the glassware for, Doc? Those are flasks and test tubes. I'm a bacteriologist. They, uh, what? I work with infectious diseases. I try to find vaccines that will prevent or cure them. Yeah. Does it pay off? In satisfaction, yes. Nuts. <laughs> Red, look at this. You got a rabbit in here. That's not a rabbit. It's a guinea pig. What's the idea? I use them for experiments. Well, he looks like he eats good. Look how fat he is, Red. Yeah. He certainly is fat. Hey, well, well, what are you doing? Yes. Don't take him up, please, up I want to try a little experiment on my arm. I want to see if he can breathe when I squeeze his neck. You're strangling him. <laughs> well, it's always good for a laugh. Well, you... You... You've killed him. You've strangled him to death. Sure. Just so you remember, Doc, there ain't no difference between his neck <laughs> and yours. <laughs> The ocean tides can be depended on to rise and fall according to a fixed schedule of time. But mist and fog, the soupy fog that billows in from the high seas and hovers over the beaches like a curtain of oil, that can never be relied upon to leave, and even the threats of three armed killers have no effect upon its arrival or departure. What's the matter with that fog? How many nights we got to hang out in this hole? Ah, Joe won't be around tonight, Brid. I just took a look at the beach. Worse than yesterday. As Mark Twain once said, everyone talks about the weather, but no one seems to be able to do anything about it. <laughs> Shut up, Duke. The duck's downstairs. Playing with his bugs. And the dame? And the kitchen. Red, what happens when we leave? What do you mean, what happens? Joe's going to pull us off that beach in a motorboat. He takes us to a tank at 12 miles out, and we head for South America. So what? What Smiley is trying to tell you is that the plan is perfect, provided no one else is aware of it. That's what I mean. If we happen to leave anyone behind who can notify the Coast Guard, that tanker won't get very far. We ain't leaving nobody behind who can talk. Wait. Yeah. Look. What are you doing in here? I, I wanted to go into the laboratory. My father hasn't had his dinner yet. I'm bringing it down to him. <laughs> You sure are nice to your old man, baby. You ever like to be nice to anybody else? Take your hands off me. <laughs> Take it easy going down them steps, baby. Them pins of yours are too cute to be busted. You think the girl heard what we said about getting rid of them? And if she did there, so what? It ain't gonna do either of them any good. Oh, hey, dinner. Oh, that's sweet of you, my dear. Dad, I want to tell you something. I just heard them talking upstairs. They're going to kill us before they leave, Father. They're afraid we know too much about their plans. What's going on down there? Nothing. It's sure taking a long time to park that hash. They're coming down. Don't be nervous, Anne. What are you two cooking up? Oh, we've, we've just been talking. Yeah. You spent too much time down there, Doc. I don't like it. I have work to do. That's so. Sure. You got nothing to work with now. So you got no work to do. And no reason to be down here. You shouldn't have done that. No. You'll regret it. Yeah! You're getting too smart, Doc. Next time you'll have a mouthful of teeth. Hey, Red. You got some of that stuff on your clothes. Uh, what stuff? That junk that was in them tubes. Some of spilled on me, too. Here. Let me brush you. That won't do you any good. What? The bacilli in those tubes were among the most dangerous known to man. And they strike very quickly. Well, what, what's he talking about? Uh, I don't know. Have you ever heard of bubonic plague? Stop dishing out them fancy words. Speak English. I've been working on bubonic plague for years. It's one of the most horrible diseases in creation. In a day or two, 
Perhaps you'll begin to know what I mean. <laughs> what are you trying to do? Put a scare into us, Doc? We'll see when the time arrives. Come on, get moving. From now on, you and the dame stay inside the bedroom. And you don't come out, see? Unless you're asked. Time seems to stand still for my enemies, Red, Smiley, and Duke. But let's see what happens. The fog's still as bad as ever. There's no sign of Joe. Or maybe tomorrow night. Hey, Duke. Yes, old boy? You're a smart guy. Brilliant is the word. Yeah. What's a bubonic plague? A disease. Uh, it ain't bad, though. Is it? My dear Red, in the Middle Ages, bubonic plague killed people like flies. It's a frightful contamination. Frightful. Why do you ask? Well, yesterday we busted up the old man's glass factory. Now we got some stuff in our clothes, too. He said it was uh, bubonic plague. What are you looking at? A bu bubonic plague? Stop looking at me like that and talk. I, I don't know what to say. Hmm. How can he have a disease cooped up in a test tube? He was lying, wasn't he? I... I don't know. If he was working with a bacilli... That's the word he used. Hey, hey, what are you moving away for? I want to sit down. Over here. Away from you. What are you sniffling about, Smiley? You've been doing that for an hour. I don't know. I, I got an itch in my nose. An itch? Yeah, and my, uh, my chest feels well, kind of funny. What do you mean? You feel sick? Hey, wait a minute. I didn't get no disease. I'm all right. I... Keep away from me. Keep away. Duke, are you nuts? Bubonic plague. I'd rather be dead than have bubonic plague. Bubonic. Get the doc in here, Smiley. Come inside, doc. Why, yes. What? What is it? Now, now, listen, doc. And listen hard. Don't lie to me. Or I'll stitch your ribs with slugs. How do you know when, when you get this bubonic plague? The symptoms are very easy to recognize. Yeah? Itching nose, heaviness in the chest. That's the beginning. Red, I got it. The nose itches because the bacilli enter the body that way. Later, the pains in the chest become more painful. And circulation ceases in the extremities. Yes, the extremities. What, 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 what does that mean? It means your arms and legs can, can fall off. It's a slow death. One of the most painful known to civilization. Uh, take a look at Smiley and see, see if he got it. I know he has. Oh, don't say that, <laughs> Doc. But I'm looking at you now, Red. Me? Yes. yes. Does your nose itch? No, I'm sure it does. How does your chest feel? Is it heavy? I'll kill you for it! Red, don't touch him. He may be your only chance. And yours, too. Mine? You can't help contracting the disease. Those broken test tubes have made this place a death house. What, what about you and your daughter? If we get it, you get it too. Oh, no, no. I told you I was working on it. I have found a vaccine for it. We've been injected. We're immune. Hey, can you give us an injection too? Shut up. Of course I can if you want it. You ain't giving us nothing. Now get back into that room. All right. Just as you say. Look, Rad, you've got to be reasonable. He's lying. He's trying to scare us. When Joe shows up, I'll knock the two of them off myself. He can't scare me, not Red Fulton. I'm tough, see? I'm as hard as nails. And I'm tough man around here, understand? <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be finished in a couple of days if the doc don't help us. Call him in, Red. Shut up. <laughs> It's two to one. You don't have to take the injection if you don't want to. But we will. <laughs> I, I have the hypodermics ready, gentlemen. If you've stopped bickering and you want to live, I can give you the vaccine. I'm ready, Doc. All right, roll up your sleeve. So am I. Well, Red? <coughs> will it hurt? Not very much. Mm -hmm. Just a pinprick. Mm. Which sleeve should I roll? Either one will do. Just hold steady. It'll all be over in a moment. Hey! There. Me next, Doc. All right. Aye, aye. There. 
And you? If you please, Doctor. All right. And there we are. I haven't poisoned you, if that's what you're afraid of. I suggest you all sit down now and relax to give the solution a chance to go through your bodies. <laughs> you know, I feel better already. <laughs> so, so do I. <laughs> the pain in my chest is gone away. <laughs> It'll be completely gone in just a moment, Red. <coughs> oh, gee. See, that's funny. I, I feel... Tired? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Tom. Hey. You ain't kidding, I... I can hardly keep my... Hey. Wait. Hey, wait a minute. Smiley. He's asleep, Red. And the Duke will be with him in just a second. Uh, uh, asleep? Let's see. Hey, where, what did... My, my rod... Where's my... You'd be too hmm. weak even to lift it, Red. Hmm. Just relax and go to sleep. Hmm. Father! Father! It's all right, Anne. Everything's fine. They're all fast asleep. Yes. Morphine, my dear, is a wonderful thing. Don't you think? Well, Doc, I've got to hand it to you. Officer, I trust my recent guests are safely behind bars where they belong. They're our guests now, but it's only a temporary... They're getting the chair for the murder of that guard. And what about their accomplice, the man with the boat? He showed up just as you said he would. It'll be a long time before he goes for a boat ride again. <laughs> well, that seems to conclude just about everything. Um, there's uh, only one thing we can't figure out, Doc. What's that? Red and Smiley kept saying something about bubonic plague. They were scared stiff when they woke up in the squad car. And the other one, the Duke... He kept complaining about an itchy nose and a pain in his chest. Oh, yes, yes. You see, they smashed some of my equipment. And there were certain viruses in some of the test tubes. Bubonic plague? Oh, no, no, not bubonic plague. I'm working on something else. They they kept saying you didn't cure them. They, they said you didn't do them any good. I'm afraid they're right. <laughs> you see, I've been working on it for a long time, officer... But so far, I've still been unable to find a cure for the common cold. Yes, I find I have many friends, like Dr. Carter, for instance. In his own quiet way, he makes good use of time. And as for my enemies, well, surprisingly enough, I know of three in particular who have lately become my friends. They are watching the clock now with eager concentration and hope. They are watching for a reprieve which will never come and which they don't deserve. I can bring them no reprieve, my friends, for that is beyond my power. But as my hands go round and the seconds tick slowly off, Sooner or later, I will be able to bring them justice. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. This program was written by Lawrence Clee and starred Hart McGuire as the clock. Also heard were Frank Waters as Red, Beryl Marshall as Anne, Ozzie Wenburn as Smiley, Leonard Bullen as Dr. Carter, together with Gordon Chater and Gordon Glenwright. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Felis Domestica, better known as the common house cat, is rumored to have nine lives, while man is presumed to have but one. 
Such is the common conception. But there are some who believe otherwise. There are some who say that the present life they live is merely one of a number. And that if you could go back in time, you would find yourself again in another age, perhaps in another form. Well, I don't intend to take sides in the matter, but I was wondering if I could offer anything by way of evidence. A story, perhaps. The tale of one John Shepley. A man whose clock turned backward in a most unconventional way. A man who returned to a life he had lived once before. Sit down, my dear. Relax. I suppose I'm behaving like a child, Dr. Brewster, but I'm frightened. I don't know what I've been through in these last few weeks. Well, suppose you'd tell me about it, Jean. You know, of course, that John and I are soon to be married. I was hoping for the pleasure of attending your wedding. Wedding? I don't know anymore if there'll be a wedding. Why? What's happened? John's ill, Dr. Brewster. Ill? Oh, not physically, but... There's something wrong with his mind, I think. It started with a dream. A dream? Yes. He's had that dream every night for the last three weeks. He won't tell me what it is exactly, but... I can see what it's doing to him. It's changing his personality. It's making him behave like someone else. I see. I love him very much, Dr. Brewster. Up to now, I was sure he loved me. And now? I don't know. I came to you as a last resort. But, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, Jean. I, I can't interpret these dreams for him. You're his friend, Dr. Brewster. Perhaps the only one he can talk to. And you may be the only one who can save him. Save him? You sound as if, as if his life's in danger. It is, Dr. Brewster. It is. <laughs> John, what is this thing that Jean fears so much? What's happened between you? Dr. Brewster, I, I'm going to ask you a very odd question. Oh, I'm used to odd questions. Do you believe in reincarnation? Reincarnation? Do you believe man can live more than once? That you and I and Jean once existed before in a, in a different era? Well, first tell me, do you believe in it? Yes, I do. Why? Because I have proof. And what's your proof? For the past three weeks, I've had a dream. A recurrent dream, always exact, down to the tiniest detail. And what's the substance of that dream? The substance, Dr. Brewster, is that I'm a murderer. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't believe me, do you? I don't know what to say. I, I, I tell you, it's the truth. I'm a murderer, Dr. Brewster. It's come back to me again and again, night after night. The dagger. His blood on the chair in the palace. Did you recognize your victim? Yes. Well, who was he? His name was the Normand de Troyes. He was married to the Marquise de Pompadour. Marquise de Pompadour? Oh, good heavens. That woman's been dead for almost 200 years. I know. And she was beautiful. I loved her, Dr. Brewster, and I, I gave my life for her. Oh, I know. I sound like a maniac. Well, maybe I am. Sometimes I wonder myself. And yet I can't get over it. That feeling of having lived during the reign of Louis XV, of having been in love with Madame Pompadour. And of having murdered her husband. John, listen to me. Go to a psychiatrist. I don't need a psychiatrist, Dr. Brewster. I have to work this out for myself in some way. But if you go on like this, do you know where it might end? For Jean? And I, I know. In unhappiness. But I can't help myself... As wretched as I feel about her part in it. And for you, John? Do you know what the ending might be for you? Murder will out, Dr. Brewster. And the only ending for a murderer is the hangman's noose. You've only one hope, Jean. You've got to get his mind away from the past. You've got to make him realize he lives in the present, that today is what counts. We used to have such fun together. Now I hardly see him. Try to relive those moments with him. Take him to the theater, the art museums. Do what you used to do. And make him forget about himself. I'll try, Dr. Brewster. I'll try very hard. And Jean did try. With all her strength and all her heart. She tried to hold the man she loved to keep him from leaving her forever. 
and for a while it seemed she might succeed. For a short time, John forgot his dreams and his strange compulsions. Until one day in an art museum, as he and Jean walked slowly through the marble corridors. John, look at this Vermeer. Oh, isn't it exquisite? Yes, it is. He was a great artist, Jean. Everything about his work showed genius. Let's look at the cars. Look at the... What are you smiling at? Nothing. It's just that I'm so happy. You are? These last few weeks have been so different. We've come closer together again. Oh, darling, you're the John I know and fell in love with. <laughs> now, let's see what's in that room, shall we? Oh, it's only furniture. I'd rather see the rest of the oils. But if you want to see it, darling... Yes, I do. Come into that room with me, Jean, please. It's a French living room. Furniture's antique. Yes. Why, it says here... This room was occupied by... Louis XV. I've been inside it before, Jean. Here, in the museum? No. What do you mean, John? No, I remember this furniture, when it was new. You what? I'll show you, I do. I remember every piece. Every piece. Now, you see that cabinet in the corner? Well... Open it. We're not supposed to touch the... Open it, Jean. It, it may prove something. If you find a... a dagger inside that cabinet, a bloodstained dagger, I know I'm right. John, please. Open it, Jean. Uh, all right. Oh, you found it. Yes. I put it there. John, let's get out of here. No, no, I've got to stay. John, if you love me at all. What are you doing? The blood is still here on the chair. I'll never forget the blood. John, John please take me home. Look, Jean, that painting on the wall. Do you know who she is? No. Jean Antoinette Poisson, Marquise de Pompadour. The most beautiful woman who ever lived. You stare at that picture like a man in love. I was years ago. Odd, isn't it? Her first name. And yours. But the same, I mean. John! If you don't mind, Gina, I want to stay here alone for a while. With the woman I love. John stood there for a long moment after Jean had gone, staring up at the beautiful portrait. I watched him from my perch above the high French cabinet. Then I spoke. Huh? I said hello. Who are you? Where are you? It isn't necessary for you to see me. We've met before. Have we? At least you think we have. I was around in Louis's time, and I knew the Marquise very well. To know her was to love her. Perhaps. However, your memory may not be what you think it is. How do you mean? You'd like to return, wouldn't you? You'd like to go back a couple of hundred years. More than anything else in the world. Are you sure you won't regret it? I'll take that chance. It's the only thing that can save me now. I've, I've, I've got to know the truth. What time do you have? Oh, it's uh, ten past four. You're slow by five minutes. Well? I'm going to add 200 years to that five minutes. I'm going to make that timepiece in your wrist run slow by two centuries. What are you doing? What's happening to me? You're going back, my friend, to the Marquise de Pompadour. And I wish you a pleasant journey. Just a moment. Oh, the door was locked. For a moment, I thought something had happened to you. Who are you? Who am I? What is wrong with you? I'm Charles de Port, secretary to the Marquise. That's who I am. Secretary to the Marquise. The Marquise de Pompadour? Naturally. But then, uh, I must be in Versailles, the palace of Versailles. Perhaps you need a doctor, monsieur. You seemed quite well a few moments ago when I went to inform the Marquise of your arrival. But now... I'm quite all right. <laughs> Just a fainting spell. I, I've had them occasionally. A fainting spell? Hmm. 
Well, I hope you don't faint when you see the Marquise. She doesn't have too much respect for men who uh, behave like kittens. Just lead me to her, Deport. And see how I behave. This is a great honor, madame. You may rise, monsieur. It'll be au depot. Very well, madame. <coughs> to what do I owe this privilege, madame? To your price as a servant, perhaps? Or to your reputation with the ladies? The ladies, madame? <laughs> Come now, you can relax with me. I'm a commoner just as you are, by birth. You're also the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. If Louis should hear you, your life would be a short one. It's worth the risk. <laughs> You're very gallant. It goes well with your reputation. <laughs> my reputation seems to have traveled a great deal farther than I have. I brought you here to offer you an opportunity. I would like you to become my personal bodyguard. Your protector, madame. My protector, defender, and companion. Nothing would please me more. Think well before you answer. My demands may be rather dangerous at times. Danger doesn't worry me. I have enemies. You, enemies? Yes. There is one who I'm very much afraid of. And who is that? My husband. Or should I say, my ex-husband. As you know, we were divorced. Le Normand seemed to feel that my friendship with the king was damaging to his reputation. <laughs> Idiotic, isn't he? Very, madame. However, I'm sure you can handle him. I'm going to ask that you be transferred from the king's guard. I can arrange it. I can arrange practically anything in France. So I've heard. If you hadn't died as you did at the age of 43, France might have become... What? Oh, I... I beg your pardon. That, that was a silly thing to what say. What on earth are you talking about? I am only 30 now. What is this nonsense about my death at 43? Oh, please forgive me, madame. Do you set yourself up to be a seer? I might surprise you, madame. What kind of a trick are you playing, oh, monsieur? No trick, madame. I... I have hunches, that's all. Hunches? Well, it's, it's purely guesswork. But it, it's not guesswork when I tell you that I would lay down my life for you. Gladly. Would you? Yes. I'm glad you said that, monsieur. You are, madame. Yes. For I may give you the chance. Monsieur de Porte? Well, monsieur? The Marquise has given orders for me to be quartered here in the palace. Oh. I am to have the West Suite. Ah, the West Suite, no less. Oh, she favors you, monsieur. <laughs> Come this way. I presume there's a bath attached. What did you say? A bath. A tub or a shower. I want to have one in my suite. <laughs> but that's ridiculous. It is? But this is only March. March? What, do you mean to say... A little perfume will make you feel better. Perfume? My foot. I want a bath with soap. But baths are not in season now. Did you hear what I said, Deport? Hmm? Whatever you wish, monsieur. It's, uh... Your skin. John. What? Why are you speaking to me, monsieur? Deport can't hear me, John, but you can. Oh, I, I see. I beg your pardon, monsieur. Get rid of Deport, John. I want to talk to you alone. I was thinking of taking a bath. The bath can wait. Whom are you speaking to, monsieur? Why are you looking behind you? There's no one there. Oh, I'll, I'll be with you in just a few minutes, Deport. Wait for me in the next corridor. Oh, very well, sir. The man is man. Well, John, how do you like it? How does it feel to live in the 18th century? It's a fantastic experience. It, it's something I've always wanted to do. You mean you don't want to go back? Never. Not as long as she is alive. You're speaking of Madame de Pompadour? Yes. John, you're making a big mistake. It's my life. I can do what I like with it. See it yourself. I promise I won't ask you again. But I suggest you keep your dream in mind. My dream? You were a murderer in that dream, John. It was a dream you couldn't escape. And the man you believed you murdered was the husband of Madame Pompadour. The man she wants you to guard her against. Well, what about it? Nothing. I was just wondering if history would repeat itself in reverse. I love 
want to ride early in the morning. It makes the blood pour through my veins with new strength. I could ride this way for the rest of my life. With you. <laughs> Careful. They say that even the horses are loyal to the king. <laughs> You're so hardened. I love you. I can't keep it to myself any longer. Just one kiss, please. One kiss. And what would you give for one kiss? Anything you ask. Come closer, darling. There, you've had your kiss. And as far as payment is concerned, I intend to exact it shortly. You sent for me, son? The time has come for you to prove yourself. What do you want me to do? My husband, the normal... He's trying to blackmail me. Yes? He knows about us, and he intends to tell the king. You've got to stop him. Don't worry about it. I'll handle him. How? I'll give him two days to get out of France. Oh, that won't do. You don't know what it's like, Georges. He hates me. He's even threatened to take my life. And he has agents, men who would murder for a sou. As long as he lives, Georges, I'll have no peace. You've got to kill him tonight. But, but, but surely there must be another way, Jean. Can it be that you are afraid? You know better than that. I only know that you can't possibly love me if you permit Lalomo to live. You'll never see me again if you do. Oh, John. I mean that. Oh, my darling. My darling, you've got to help me. He terrifies me. Please don't fail me now. Where can I find this Lenormo? I have asked him to come to the castle tonight. The king is in Paris. You can deal with him here as you like. Will you do it for me? Let me know when he arrives. Here. Take this ring. It will bring you luck. Do you see this inscription on the inside? Pompadour. Oh, no. Wear it on your finger. Wear it on the hand that holds the sword. As you can see, no matter what period of history, time is always the same. And so are the men and women. He has entered the palace, Monsieur Lefebvre. He'll come through this corridor in a moment or two. He'll have his chance to draw his sword. His sword? Are you crazy? A duel would bring a household down on you. You've got to use his dagger and use it quickly before he can utter a sound. You mean stab him in the back? Yes. But that's murder in cold blood. That's the way it must be done. He'll take it. We can wait behind these portieres. As he passes, let him have it. Oh, no, wait. Here he comes. No. No, not this way. I can't. Give me the dagger. With the compliments of the Marquis. Yes. Quick, before the guards come, take this dagger and hide it in the cabinet. He never had a chance. You... you... Quiet! It is her ladyship. What is this? What? Oh! Oh, no, 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 speak to me. He's dead, madame, dead. And his murderer is over there. You're lying to Port, you killed him yourself. Silence. So, this is the way you will pay my trust in you, Monsieur de Fayette. Jean, you... How dare you address me that way? No, you can't be serious. Put him under arrest. Monsieur de Fayette, I see that you get the guillotine for this. Take him away. <laughs> Good evening, Monsieur Lefebvre. What? Where is the Marquise? Oh, the Marquise is not in the habit of visiting cutthroats in a dungeon. She sent me in her place. What is it you wish? Nothing. I shouldn't have asked her to come. I should have known she'd refuse. At dawn, you will die, Monsieur. May I uh, offer my apologies? If I could get at your throat! <laughs> <laughs> Save your strength, Monsieur. You will need it to climb the guillotine steps. The fact that it was I who killed Lenormand is unimportant. Had you killed him yourself in fair fight, you would still be on your way to your grave. You mean she'd planned it so that I... Naturally. You don't think for one moment that she wanted you around after your job was finished? But she, she was just using me. Lenormand was still her husband. They were never actually divorced. And that was a nuisance to her ladyship, inasmuch as she had other plans. Plans which concerned the king. So that's what really happened. 
I beg your pardon? And I thought... I thought that I was a murderer. <laughs> but I'm not, you see, I'm not. You have a very peculiar sense of humor, monsieur. You don't understand, you fool. You can't hurt me. I can go back. I can... Or can I? Is it too late? Is it too late? It is never too late, monsieur, for Madame Guillotine. We are ready, Monsieur Lefebvre. Before I give the signal and your head rolls, is there anything you wish to say? Yes. I have a friend somewhere who brought me here. Where are you? I want to go back. You were right. Please take me back. Please take me back. Have you learned your lesson, John? Just give me one more chance, that's all I ask. Just one more chance. Just one more chance. One more. Executioner, do your duty. John, John, darling, are you all right? What? Oh, was it you, Jean? I had to come back. I couldn't leave you here like this. Jean. Look as though you've been ill. You haven't moved from this spot since I left the museum. Ill? I'm well, Jean. I'm well and I've come back to you. John. I was wrong about everything. <laughs> I'm not a murderer, Jean. Really, I'm not. And I'll never have those dreams again. And what about her? That woman in the portrait up there. The Marquise de Pompadour. The Marquise? She's just as dead, Jean, as my love for her. She's part of the past, that's all. And I'm here in the present with you. Well, there's your story. What's that? The events are not historically correct. I agree with you. According to the history books, it didn't quite happen that way. But then, historians deal with important facts. And you must admit that a mere romance could have been omitted by the textbooks. However, there's just one more thing. I was still there when John and Jean left the museum arm in arm. As he walked out of the room, he accidentally dropped a small metal object on the floor. It was a ring. A large ring that may have been worn by a woman. And there was one word inscribed on the band. That word was... Pompadour. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. This program was written by Lawrence Clee and narrated by Hart McGuire as The Clock. As John, you heard Charles Tingwell. Others were Coralie Neville, John Bushell, Sheila Sewell, David Butler. The Clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. <laughs>
Here, Wilton, have a cigar. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing like a good meal to make a man feel at peace with the world and <laughs> to give him an urge to talk. <laughs> good conversation is the final course for a perfect dinner. <laughs> Let me tell you a little story, Wilson. You, you've got some time, haven't you? Hmm? This will be worth your while. You know, this isn't the only first-rate meal I've ever had. There was a time once when caviar and lobster were on my menu every day. Mm, is that so? The world was my oyster, Wilson, and I was salting it to my taste. <laughs> of course, it didn't begin that way. You used to be a valet, didn't you? That's right. I worked as somebody's boot polisher for over seven years. He was a wealthy man, a multimillionaire. Oh, uh, have some wine, Wilson? Um, no, thanks. Yes, I worked like the proverbial horse for Gregory Richards. And I found that he didn't appreciate my merits. It was rather disappointing, to say the least. But I am a man of some ingenuity. I waited for my chance, and when it came, I was ready for it. The servants have all been dismissed, Mr. Richards. All right, Fletcher. Has Mrs. Richards come in? Uh, just a moment ago, sir. I told her that you were in the library. Has she noticed anything? Not that I know of, sir. That'll be all, Fletcher. You mean, uh, for now, Mr. Richards? I mean, you're going, too, with the rest of them. Oh, I... I see, sir. Sorry I have to do it this way, but we're closing the house. You've been a good valet, Fletcher. I hate to lose you. But I have no other choice. If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Richards, isn't this dismissal rather abrupt after so many years of service? I'm giving you a month's pay in advance. That's fair enough. I don't quite see it that way, sir. What do you mean you don't quite see it? I have been a little more to you than just a valet. Have you? I might say I have been your, uh, confidant. Just what are you getting at? It seems to me that a small, uh... A pension of perhaps $5,000 would repay me for my service. Oh, really? You must admit that I've been discreet, very discreet. Are you trying to blackmail me? If your affair with Miss Cartwright had been entrusted to less capable hands than mine... All right, Fletcher, get out. <laughs> Mr. Richard... Get out before I break your filthy neck. Very well. But, Mr. Richards, you may have reason one day to regret this. Goodbye, sir. Where is everybody? Gregory. Gregory. What is it, dear? What's going on in this house? Where are the servants? They're gone, Harriet. Gone? What do you mean, gone? Where's Fletcher? He's gone, too. I dismissed them all. Gregory, have you gone crazy? On the contrary, I've made up my mind to a very difficult decision. Have you? I'm sick of this house, Harriet, and everything it stands for. I've made arrangements with a broker to sell it. Without consulting me? I have no reason to consult you about anything any longer. The plain fact is that I'm leaving you, Harriet. For good. Well, so you've come up with it at last. I'm glad you knew it was coming. I'm glad you realize we can't go on this way. It makes it easier. What do you think I am, an old pair of shoes? Do you really believe you can dismiss me like the servants and get away with it? I'll provide you with money. Money? And what about my pride? Do you think I want to face my friends after you've thrown me over for that woman? Then you know. Yes, I know. I've known for a long time. You think you'll get a divorce from me? Well, it'll be over my dead body. Harriet. Anne Cartwright, the darling of polite society. Anne Cartwright, the champ. Harriet, I will. I'll ruin you. her. That's what I'll do. I'll splash this thing over every tabloid in the country. And I'll ruin you, too. I'll show you up to your fancy friends for what you are. You wait and see. Why? Why would you? You never loved me. I gave you everything money could buy. Why don't you give me my freedom now when it means nothing to you? Because I hate you, that's why. And I hate her. Oh, I know what her family's like. They won't allow you to get within ten feet of her as long as you're married. You think you can make a fool of me, Gregory? Well, you'd better think twice. So this is how you want it to be? Just wait until I really get started. I'll show you how I want it to be. She won't be able to show her face again. You wouldn't dare. She'll want to run away. And find a hole to hide in. Harriet! The trap! The duck! <laughs> No, you won't get away with that, Harriet. Help me. Let me. Go. Let me. Go. You went too far. I told you. Harriet. Harriet, get up. Harriet. He's dead. I've got to do something. But where? How? Oh. I've got it. Yes, yeah, the cellar. The cellar. Underneath the cement. In the morning, 
Well, I never know. Do you need any help, sir? Achoo. You've done a pretty good job, a very good job, Mr. Richards. May I suggest that a layer of cement over that tomorrow will hide it forever? I thought you'd gone. Oh, no, Mr. Richards, I'm still here, as you see. Achoo. Don't play a hand on me, Mr. Richards, not unless you want to face this kitchen knife. All right, Fetcher, you win. Call the police. The police? Go on, turn me in. Oh, 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 Mr. Richards, as I told you once before, you uh, underestimate my value. Why call the police? What do you mean? The police would do neither of us any good. How much do you want? Oh, 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 now, really, Mr. Richards. Ten thousand? Twenty? A bargain's a bargain. Name your price. You may find it rather high. But then, your life is worth something, too, Mr. Richards. What is it? <laughs> For heaven's sake, don't stand there grinning like an idiot. What do you want to keep quiet? Everything, Mr. Richards. Everything. Sit down, Fletcher. Thank you. Not there. That's my chair. I know it. Now, look. You've got a price. I want to know how much you want. Do you mind if I have one of your cigars? Thank you. Of all the... Maybe you don't quite understand the situation you're in, Mr. Richards. Your life is in the palm of my hand. If I pick up that phone, I can put a noose around your neck so fast you wouldn't know what hit you. What are you trying to do? Torture me? Are you just playing with me to amuse yourself before you turn me in? I have no intention of turning you in, providing, of course, we come to terms. What are your terms? I've asked a dozen times. And I've told you. Everything. I'm going to live the way you live and enjoy what you enjoy for the rest of your natural life. Make that a little clearer. Yes, I suppose I must. From now on, I'll be the fine gentleman, Mr. Richards. From now on, I'll see what it's like to live in Velvet. Oh, but of course, you live here with me. That's decent of you. Yes, and what's more, you'll wait on me the way I waited on you. Do you hear? You'll be the valet, Mr. Richards, and I'll be the master. You're mad. Not entirely, no. However... I am a generous man. I won't confine you to the house. You may leave occasionally, providing you let me know where you're going. I don't mind. That's very big of you. And there'd be no point in your running away either. I'd have the police on your neck in a hurry if you did. And besides, Miss Cartwright would also be involved. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Gregory, dear, did I keep you waiting? Uh, sit down, Anne, please. Have you ordered? No, no, I... Can't stay for lunch. I have another appointment. But it's been so long since we've seen each other. What is it, Gregory? Why are you worried? Did you tell your wife? Yes, I told her. And she refused to give you a divorce? Well, we were expecting that. She didn't we... refuse, Anne. No? As a matter of fact, she's in Reno right now. Oh, Gregory, then she understood. Perfectly. Oh, Gregory, if you're ashamed of what we've done, you needn't be. And I have something else to tell you. What is it? For a while, I mean, until this blows over, we mustn't see each other. Mustn't see each other? But why? We've nothing to hide anymore. I insist on it, Anne. It's the only way. How long do you think that will be? I couldn't say. A few months, maybe. Gregory. We've no other choice, don't you see? We've got to give this some dignity. We've got to protect ourselves from gossip. Gossip doesn't worry me. I've already told my father and mother the situation. You have? Yes, I have. I told them I'm not afraid of scandal, and, and I love you. I gave them a choice. They either see it my way, or I leave the house. You mean that? I do, dear. And I thought Harriet would ruin him. Gregory. This is a fine time to find out. Darling, you look so tired. I am tired. You need a rest. Why not go away for a week or two? No. Bermuda, perhaps, it'll do you good. No, I can't go away. I can't leave town. Don't ask me to. It was only a suggestion. And I've got to leave you now. So soon? Yes, I must. Oh, Gregory, what's wrong? I'm afraid, Anne. Afraid of what? Something I can't explain. Surely you can tell me. No, I can't tell anyone, not even you. Gregory, look at me. There's nothing, my darling, that can't be wiped out and forgotten. Wiped out? That's it, Anne. That's the only way. I've thought about it and tried to plan it, but somehow my thoughts were never clear. You've clarified them for me completely. Where are you going, Gregory? What are you going to do? I'm going to erase this problem from my life forever. Once the cake is cut, the saying goes, it is simple to enjoy another piece. Once the timekeeper loses track of the seconds in your mind, the clock runs wild. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And what does it profit the killer 
to take a human life and lose his own in return. Yes, what is it? Fletcher? Come in, Richards. I thought I told you to call me Mr. Fletcher when you address me, Richards. Do you have the check? Yes. Here. Mm -hmm. 10,000. Fine, you may go now. You may even take the afternoon off, my good fellow. I have something else here besides the check, Mr. Fletcher. <laughs> so I see. There are six bullets in this gun. I'm going to fill your rotten body with them. And what do you propose to do with me? Put me in the cellar next to your wife? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know why I never did this before. It's so easy, it makes me laugh. Richard, you're a fool. Am I? Put the gun down. If you kill me, you die too. You whip me long enough, Fletcher. The party's over. You idiot. Don't you think I'm prepared for this? Do you consider me to be so childish I let you get away with so simple a trick? What, what, what do you mean you're prepared for it? There's a note in my bank vault to be opened at my death. That note gives complete directions as to where the late Mrs. Richards can be found. And how she got there. No. You didn't. Put the gun on top of my desk, Richards, before you make me lose my temper. <laughs> and that would be inconvenient for both of us. That's better. You've worked it out completely, haven't you? To the last detail. Clever, wasn't it? Incidentally, you met Anne Cartwright for luncheon this afternoon. You followed me? She's very pretty. Oh, yes, extremely attractive and young. A man could learn to appreciate a woman like that. I wonder how attractive I'd be to her. I'd like you to invite her here, Richards, for dinner. I want to know more about her. I have a feeling that we could become very good friends. Just what are you driving at? I told you I wanted everything, and everything includes Miss Cartwright. Extend the invitation, Richards, for tomorrow night. Why, you... Richards! <laughs> Mind your manners. Tell Miss Cartwright she'll be having dinner with me at eight tomorrow evening, and Richards, that dinner will be for two. <laughs> Good evening, Fletcher. Good evening. May I take your things? Thank you. Will you tell Mr. Richards I'm here? He's not in at the moment. He isn't? No, he suggested that uh, I entertain you for a while. You? Will you have a whiskey and soda? No, thank you. You don't mind if I have one, do you? Fletcher, have you been drinking? Oh, well, I've had three or four, just enough to make my conversation interesting. Please tell Mr. Richards to call me when he arrives. Are you leaving? Yes, I am. You're very impulsive, Anne. I was looking forward to an enjoyable evening. I even prepared the dinner myself. Fletcher, do you realize that Mr. Richards will dismiss you for this? Dismiss me? <laughs> dismiss me? <laughs> oh, that's very good. Fletcher. <laughs> Mr. Richards' dismissing days are over. From now on, he's taking orders, not giving them. You're not only <laughs> drunk... You're crazy. Am I? Then, why has he changed so much in the past few weeks? Why does he crawl around like a worm, afraid of his own shadow? And why haven't you seen him as much as you used to? You know about that? <laughs> yes, my dear, I do. You see, I've taken over for Mr. Richards. His very life depends on me. Oh, you're lying. Why should I? What good would lying do me? Fletcher, just what did you mean when you said that... that his life depends on you? Oh, it's nothing to bother your pretty head about. Suffice to say that I'm the man worth knowing now. I can do as much for you as he ever could, and more. Fletcher, answer me. What did you mean? Oh, well, it has something to do with money. He's, uh, he's in a difficult spot, and... I've taken over all his financial responsibilities. Now I know you're out of your mind. What would a valet know about finance? A valet, am I? I'm a great deal better than that, Anne, I assure you. I demand to know where Mr. Richard is. He's gone. Gone? Yes, he's uh, run away. He's not coming back. Oh, you expect me to believe that? No, I don't. And that's why he left this note. What note? Here. 
Well, let me read it to you. Dearest Anne, I am going away for good. You won't see me again, so forget about me. <clears throat> Fletcher, my trusted friend, has taken over my estate. I can't explain why or how, just trust in him completely. And it's signed Gregory. Let me see that. There you are. You ought to recognize his handwriting by this time. Dearest Anne. But why did he go? What have you to do with this? You love him, don't you? Well, I... If you love him, you'll be nice to me. The truth of the matter is that your Gregory is an embezzler, and I'm protecting him from the police. Oh, that can't be true. But it is. My darling. Oh, oh take your hands off me. <laughs> oh, really? Now, aren't you being a little... <laughs> my way. You'll come back. And when you do, you make up for that slap. Dearest Anne. Dictators are always small men, either in physical size or in moral stature. The one thing they cannot fight is time. It cuts them all down to the same size sooner or later. Listen as the clock moves on. Who's there? What? Oh, it's, it's you, Richard. Yes, it's I. I told you to get out of town and stay out. Where's Anne? She's gone. But she'll be back. Now get out of here before I lose my patience. I've given you back your life and freedom, haven't I? Get out of my sight and stay out. Yes. You've given me my life and taken everything else. And what you've taken, Fletcher, is more valuable to me than what you've returned. Do you want me to call the police and turn you in? You needn't bother. I'll do it myself. What? I don't care what happens to me anymore, Fletcher. My life's finished. But at least I'll have the satisfaction of seeing you punished along with me. Punished? For what? I haven't done anything. You've been an accessory to the crime. You've helped me keep my secret. That's enough to get you 20 years. You're bluffing. You wouldn't dare to turn yourself in. The bluff's over, Fletcher. For both of us. Put it down. This gun of yours still holds six bullets, Richard. Drop that phone. You're through, Fletcher. <laughs> uh... Through, am I? We'll see about that. You've forgotten that there's still plenty of room in the cellar for you. Just a moment. I'm coming. Well? Uh, Mr. Richards? Uh, Mr. Richards isn't in right now. My name is Fletcher. I'm handling his affairs. Oh, I see. Well, what do you want? Uh, well, I see you haven't moved the furniture out yet. Moved the furniture out? What are you talking about? Well, according to the contract, Mr. Richards is due to vacate by the 10th. That's the day. Vacate? We're not moving. But this house has been sold, Mr. Sold? When? To whom? Well, Mr. Richards instructed his broker to sell a few weeks ago. The deal's been completed. Uh, no, no, no. Now, wait a minute. There, there, there's been some mistake. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the authorization to take over the premises. Oh. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Richards has changed his mind. He, he doesn't want to sell. The house has already been sold, mister. I told you that. Then we'll buy it back and we'll give them a profit on the transaction. They'll sell it back to us. Well, uh, well, maybe. Uh, in any case, Mr. Richards is the one to decide that. What? Well, the house was in his name. He's the only one who can change the deal. Well, where is Richards? Maybe if he sent a wire... He, uh, could... he... Uh, he can't be reached. No? No. Then we'll have to go ahead, mister. Now, wait a minute. This is ridiculous. Look, mister, I didn't make the deal about the house. It was made with the Sanley Realty Corporation. But don't you work for them? No, and, and if you don't mind a little tip, you haven't got a chance in the world of buying back this place. Why do you say that? Well, the Realty Corporation's going to erect a $50 million office building, and this site is part of the layout. So don't waste your time by trying to make any deals with them. Well, if you don't work for them, who do you work for? I'm an agent for the Franklin House Wrecking Company. We've got a contract to tear this place down and make room for the office building. You're, you're going to tear it down? So you better get somebody to move your stuff out, mister. My contract calls for us to begin work today. That's right now. I've got 40 men outside and we pay them by the hour. We can't wait. Hey, Joe! Yeah. Send the boys in, will you? 
We'll start, uh, well, well, I think we'd better check to see how deep the foundations are first. And we'll start by tearing up the cellar. <laughs> well, Wilson, what do you think? Funny how it turned out for you. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't my fault. No. Oh, it was Richard who made the mistake, the fool. After killing his wife and being taken over by someone as smart as me, he just couldn't think straight. He'd completely forgotten that he'd turned the house over to a broker when he made up his mind to leave his wife. I guess you wouldn't have forgotten about it if you were running the show. I should say I wouldn't. The idiot. If he had only told me... If he'd only mentioned something... I... Well, that's how it goes. It's the fools who are responsible for all the trouble in this world. Oh. Well, thanks for the dinner, Wilson. I appreciated it. It was certainly one of the best I've ever had. Oh, don't thank me, Fletcher. It's on the state. A condemned man always gets the best. <laughs> time and distance are closely related, and one is often measured by the other. Scientists now measure the distance to the moon in rocket hours, and one day the men of the future may enable you to calculate the mileage around the world aboard your airliner in so many minutes. But one thing will always remain constant. The distance between the prison cell and the death house will always be measured by my ticking as I look down from the wall. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. This program was written by Lawrence Clee and starred Hart McGuire as the clock. Fletcher was played by Leonard Teal. As Richards, you heard Kevin Brennan. As Anne, Barbara Brunton. Gordon Glenwright was the guard. And as Harriet Richards and the agent, Sheila Sewell and Ken Hannum. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production.